Thank you so much, Dee. Um, <clears throat> my name is John Case. Um, I joined the Communist Party in 1969 uh, when I'd been arrested for a number of protests and um, the chair of the New York State Party uh, came to Buffalo, New York, and uh, while me and my friends were all being indicted and said, maybe it's time you guys talk to a professional <laughs> about this revolution stuff. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the first things I was advised to do was to, uh, you know, help build the party's industrial concentration policy at the time, which was, uh, you know, build, uh, let's build a working class revolutionary forces inside basic industry. And um, <clears throat> I, I you know, took that to California, and uh, there, uh, you know, we uh, successfully, in collaboration with the UE, uh, basically set the semiconductor industry on fire in uh, Santa Clara County with a party club um, that recruited about 25 workers, and those workers carried out campaigns, three different election campaigns and other campaigns and about 15 different plants. I went to work for the UE uh, as a uh, organizer and later international rep, and uh, you know, got involved in about uh, 25 strikes and 30, maybe more, um, contract negotiations and organizing campaigns. Um, and I took a job working for uh, the Communist Party as a district organizer in New England, um, and uh, and then eventually uh, got a degree in software and uh, went to work for Microsoft. Uh, but since then, um, in my retirement here, we've got a very active uh, local labor council in West Virginia, and um, it's uh, been a long time in the trade union movement. William Z. Foster, I was born in, 19, in 1881, same year as my grandfather, um, and um, he became the most innovative and um, creative and successful um, of the many different fighters for the principle of industrial unionism. And while that may just sound like a phrase now, it has a long history. Uh, its background starts in the late 19th century when uh, the craft unions were being formed. A craft, uh, examples of crafts were well, let me give you what was in the steel plant back at that time. Here's an example of the craft organized into separate unions, okay, within a single steel factory. 24 iron miners, coal miners, uh, the steam shovelmen, the clay workers, the quarry workers, the searmen, the steel workers, the stationary workers, the firemen, the laborers, the machinists, the railway carmen, blacksmiths, coopers, electricians, boilermakers, pattern makers, bricklayers, structural iron workers, foundry workers, molders, sheet metal workers, steam fitters, and switchmen in a single plant. Um, <clears throat> how did it get that way? Well, you can look at what happened in 1913 um, when uh, Henry Ford first uh, moved the Model T off of a mass production line. And um, that started a revolution in the means of production in the United States. Um, the steel industry, in order to uh, you know, put together a plant of, let's say, you know, 20,000 people, had to go out and recruit people from all the different trades and crafts that it needed, in addition to 10,000 other workers that were associated with no, or, no union, um, and try to put them all together uh, and to be able to put out the steel required for World War I. And... Um, so the, the intersection of the buildup for the war and the mass production uh, technology, production technology that was in Henry Ford's first factory uh, conspired to create the industrial, you know, the second industrial revolution, uh, basically in the United States and transform the working class into um, a different class in many respects, if you define class as a relationship to production, how you, what you do to make a living, um, then it was a different society that was being born. 
I want you to take a look at the uh, map. I think it's on the shared screen. It's entitled U.S. Membership and Income Inequality. And uh, I hope you all can see it. The red line is traces the uh, percent of uh, union membership in the population from about 1910 through 2010, 100 year period. And you can see it rises very steeply following 1930 all the way to 1980 um, with you know, some alterations there. The blue line is the uh, level of income inequality. The percent of people, you know, uh, the the percentage of income received by the top one percent of the population, and you can see it has a very interesting dialectical and asymmetric relationship to the growth or decline of union membership. The time we're talking about here with William C. Foster is right about where you see that second little blue arrow there, where it says National War Labor Board 1918-1919. Um, W. Z. Foster uh, had was a had just come off of a the first big I would say manufacturing industrial uh, organizing attempt in the packing house industry, which had been tried to organize by the AFL and the separate crafts many years before and always failed. He succeeded in organizing it by amalgamating the crafts associated with that industry. And it was uh, built his reputation as, mo as probably the, the top labor organizer in the country at the time. He also joined the Socialist Party, and he had a long history as being involved with uh, moving toward industrial organization with the International Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, also called. The IWW was the first industrial union, and it was built mainly on the railroads, and it was built mainly uh, and also in the... Um, Western mi mining. By industrial, we mean everybody in the industry is in the same union, not 25 or 30 different crafts. Okay, that's the fundamental difference. Um, and I, I think everyone can intu should be able to intuitively assume that, you know, having 25 unions trying to bargain together with one giant employer is an invitation to weakness and defeat. Um, <clears throat> so the arguments in practical life became very strong. Foster, um, you know, had formed a plan uh, to organize Basic Steel after Packing House. And the plan included trying to get the American Federation of Labor, led by Samuel Gompers at the time, uh, to endorse an amalgamated effort to organize steel, which at the time consisted of 350,000 uh, employees, uh, approximately, at that time. Um, and... Uh, you know, he, he, the part of the book of, uh, in the trade unionism book, Foster goes through a, uh, you know, quite a lot of detail about how he plotted and connived and tricked and did everything he could uh, to get uh, Gompers to stand in front of this amalgamated drive, okay? Um, and, my, and, and Gompers did not want to. And the reason he did not want to was that he happened to know, and he was, he was not wrong about this, is that the amalgamation drive, the formation of industrial unions would wipe out the, uh, all the 50 affiliated craft unions on his national executive board that had elected him president. Most of those unions would cease to exist. And a much larger movement, the movement would increase by, well, as you can see from the red line, when it initially succeeded, it increased many fold. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Gompers had to be played to get to put himself officially in front of it, even though behind the scenes he sabotaged the financing. And he, it didn't matter, you know, the way that the objective situation, the manufacturing, the horrors in the company towns, okay, of the steel towns, were driving the workers crazy. They, the, the resistance was building, and you had to move on it, okay. And so, he, despite the sabotage and everything, Foster was successful in getting the strike started in 1919. Uh, mainly starting in Chicago, but when they called for it, even with not so much funding and with lots of difficulties, uh, the workers responded in force. It was the biggest single strike in the history of the United States, unless you want to count uh, the post-World War II uh, rolling wave of ind different industries going on strike. Well, that might have been more. But it was the biggest single strike in the United States. Uh, it, it, was, it was defeated. Um, but it left uh, uh, an incredible mark on labor history. 
and it was clear that it was not over. The, basically, it was defeated because the craft form was not capable of organizing it. You had to come up with something new. And if you want to summarize the message of W.Z. Foster's life, it was he, he came up to trial and error through theory. So going all the way to Russia and talking to Lenin, <laughs> seriously, you know, as some of them did. Uh, to coming to trying to figure out a way to get it to happen. And um, the consequence of the Great Steel Strike was that uh, he ended up winning the party. First of all, he did it himself. He, he built a national campaign through the Trade Union Educational League uh, to build support for amalgamation. He still believed in amalgamation, but it failed. Um, you know, there was no way to, to get the leadership of the AFL to not look at the fact that they would not, they would, they would be relatively weaker, not stronger, if the industrial pattern was adopted. Uh, so then he decided, then the party, and he uh, led the, the, the decision, decided to go independent, uh, to organize industrially outside the AFL, where you couldn't amalgamate. And that led to the formation of the Trade Union Unity League, a uh, party formation that basically uh, trained a very large percentage of the leaders of the left unions uh, in the United States that ended up taking uh, 10 years later, this immense uh, upheaval led to the passage of the Wagner Act and all kinds of other reforms, which I'm sure uh, Denise will cover. Um, <clears throat> but, um, at that point, uh, the victory for industrial unionism had another uh, kind of stream that joined it and that actually made it even uh, more powerful than it had been drawing the lessons coming out of the Great Steel Strike. And that was the mine workers. In 1921, the mine workers had a civil war, the biggest internal armed battle uh, uh, in the history of the United States outside the Civil War. and um, it took place in uh, Blair Mountain, and uh, workers took arms against uh, similar, even worse, horrors in the mining towns um, that uh, are quite, right now. The 100th anniversary has been celebrated in, um, uh, at Blair Mountain, actually, this Labor Day uh, by the Mine Wars Museum in West Virginia Miners. And, uh, but it's a, 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 that stream, when the, when, the, when, the, uh, when the victims, both communists and ra labor radicals who participated in, the, in the, the war against the coal operators in 21, they got fired or indicted or thrown out of the state or blacklisted. They went to uh, see Wyndham Mortimer. A one of uh, W. Z. Foster's uh, pupils, you might say, uh, or co co colleagues, and uh, in the auto industry, and they they salted, meaning they uh, they went to work de deliberately in the auto plants in order to help build the CIO and the United Auto Workers. Now, you know, and, and one of the things that uh, that uh, Wyndham Mortimer did in his autobiography, he says, when the mine workers came from the hills of West Virginia and Kentucky into the plants, they brought a spirit of solidarity, of, of trust in each other that was unequaled in his experience. And they taught that spirit to the auto workers, too. Um, he, he paid a tribute to them. Anyway, I want to. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop my little pitch right there. I want to. Um, uh, there's a lot of aspects of this to Foster's life. The most important thing is is that they found a changed mode of production, something that had not existed before, and they had to do everything. They had to, the most important thing they had to get in with the workers. They had to figure out how. Uh, to come up with a new model that would work. And I want to suggest to you that the same challenge that exists today in a very different form. We have a different model, uh, a different mode of production that has evolved in the, our latest chapter of our history that is also going to require a similar and even broader effort to define an even better model of unionism so that workers can find a way to restore their bargaining power and to advance uh, their cause. Um, you know, Foster was uh, made a lot of friends and a lot, taught a lot of people, and he made a lot of enemies at different times. He was a sharp guy, and um, he. Uh, I want to. One of the most interesting things, uh, my own mentor, you know, was just, whose name was Don Tormey, and 
um, in Boston, Massachusetts, was the uh, you know host at a memorial <clears throat> to W. Z. Foster that was held, and um, the guest speaker was uh, Paul Sweezy, who was a kind of a Marxian economist probably for most of his career at odds with one or more some things about that, about Foster. Um, but at this uh, memorial, he, he made the most moving tribute that uh, I've ever heard to W.Z. Foster, and it was very short. It was W.Z. Foster sought the rise of the working class and never to rise above it. So I'll stop there um, and answer any questions if I can um, about it. But, but I think uh, Denise is going to go next. I think that's the plan. Thank you. Okay, John, thank you. Uh, before we open the floor for uh, comments and questions, we do have another uh, presenter, Denise Edwards, uh, will uh, join us uh, and open and present an opening for about uh, for several minutes. Denise? Okay, thanks a lot. And thanks, John. That was great. The, uh, my name's Denise Edwards. I'm in my 16th year and serving on my elected city council here in actually Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. I also currently serve as the international secretary treasurer of the Steelworkers Organization of Active Retirees, or SOAR. Uh, prior to that, I worked uh, 22 years for the various incarnations of the people's world. Uh, let me just mention two things about that. One is we got into a lot of places, including the occupation of a coal tipple south of Williamson, West Virginia, when nobody else did. And that was sort of the bond between the Communist Party's newspaper and the United Mine Workers at that time. The, uh, I also have, well, besides that, I was the first woman in the steel industry, or at least in U.S. steel. Uh, to complete the apprenticeship for the millwright trade. We are in one union, by the way, not 25. And um, besides that, I grew up very happy in Baltimore, Maryland, the home of Spires Point. So at any rate, I want to thank you all very much and just kind of to take off a little bit with John and kind of bring it up a little bit to uh, ha what's happening now. And I'm going to start with industrial unionism, which continues to be a challenge, especially in unions, which are doing a fantastic, many unions which are doing a great job, but there are issues. And so where I want to start is with an organizing campaign here in Pittsburgh of one of the largest hospitals. The RNs organize a union. They would not accept the non-four-year college educated techs and others. So what happens? Well, <laughs> Our union and many of us sat, try to sit down with folks and explain that you really have to have what they called wall-to-wall -wall organizing. That everybody who worked in the hospital system needed to be in the same union. You have one boss, you have one corporation that runs the place, and you needed to be all in the same union with one contract. So that starts. But there were other problems in industrial unionism that needed to be addressed. So my late husband gets invited to speak to this union statewide meeting of healthcare workers, which is very large, uh, literally a little over a thousand, maybe 2000 delegates uh, in, near, in Penn State. So he goes and he talks about, you know, the organization as John just, just, uh, just described at our union, in the Steelworkers Union. And uh, at the very, towards the very end, he makes a very interesting comment. And that is looking on the stage, everybody on the stage were white males, but the audience was overwhelmingly African-American and women. And George brought that out and said very, very, uh, with no, no holds barred, very clearly that this union was not gonna go forward unless we're able to organize and have the membership reflected in its leadership. It took a few years, it took some more work, but certainly some of the things in addition to the racial unity and the racial democracy, you might say, in this union, which is a very fine union, by the way, uh, to go forward. And finally, two years ago, um, 
the union organized and had a very successful, very profound campaign in the healthcare industry here, which included not only, only the techs, but many of the other non-professional staff into one local. They just completed their contract negotiations. And I'll just mention this, for many of the techs, they got a 33% rate uh, wage increase. And um, they were just thrilled. It was a big, you know, big celebration here in Pittsburgh. But that's an example of industrial unionism doesn't drop out of the sky. We may have inherited it, inherited it, but we have to fight for it. Because another aspect of industrial unionism has to be with getting unions to work together. And that is a very, can be a very difficult thing uh, on a number of different levels, especially at this stage of the game, when many of the unions, and as a result of plant closings and trade issues, all the, you know, that big vice that's been crushing workers across the country uh, for the last, well, since 1980 is usually the landmark there. So getting unions to work together when they perceive, many perceive, that they are fighting for their life is very difficult. One of the basic tenets of industrial unionism is that communists and the left work with progressive and those in the center. You know, what does that mean? That means that even though you all may not agree on various issues, we can agree on this program of struggle and fight back and getting things done. It's a very uh, active, it's not a debating society, but it's a very action oriented approach to solving problems, being on point and a program, as I just described with um, one of the hospitals here, a program that builds the union as well as improves, which is a precursor for increasing the standard of living for workers generally, with one of the main sets of that being, uh, you know, racial unity. I'll just end this little part of the presentation by citing another example based on some of Foster's book, a lot of Foster's book, to be perfectly honest, and kind of the history of, uh, you know, taking on difficult issues, difficult issues. And one of them, of course, is abortion rights. And for uh, many, many years, you know, nobody in the union would touch this issue. As a matter of fact, the story I'm about to tell, they didn't touch it then either. But nonetheless, <clears throat> so the state of Pennsylvania is getting ready to basically outlaw abortion in our state. So what happens? Well, and as like many of your states, ours is, our part of the state in particular is very heavily Catholic of its various expressions. So what happens? Well, a comrade in Harrisburg uh, gets on to the Pennsylvania Commission for Women. And she, we have a little meeting. There's all kinds of people. They're not just communists, but all kinds of activists and people in the women's movement. We get together and we say, well, what are we gonna do? So the commission always has this big luncheon and the governor comes and the legislators come, it's a big deal. So we said, okay, well, what we'll do in addition to everything else is we'll have a postcard campaign. So those of us who are steel workers said, okay, we'll go and we'll ask folks we work with, in my instance, it was all men, um, if they'll sign these postcards and we'll deliver them all to this luncheon um, to, and to the governor. So we do. So we came back to Pittsburgh. We had at our local at the time, we had a women's committee. And the, one of the issues we had to resolve was should we go to the local union for a resolution? And we decided not to. We decided as a women's committee, we would just go ahead and do this uh, postcard campaign and see what happens. Part of the issue here tactically is collective discussion, but part of it is also what it doesn't look like when people, everybody's arguing, oh, this is this big divisive issue, but you'll never get anybody to do anything because of the role of religion and personal feelings and so forth. And besides, it's mostly men. So we did. And so our women's committee went out, actually we got some of the, our coworkers, men, to help us. And at the end of the day, we sent a bag of nearly 2,000 postcards to Harrisburg just from our local. Now this happened in 
mo in all seven U.S. steel locals in, in the Monongahela Valley. But at any rate, so we go to Harrisburg and uh, our friend in Harrisburg, who's on the commission, there's a big luncheon, there's all these people, it's a big deal, cameras and all this stuff. And they dump these postcards from all over the state, including our little plant in Pittsburgh, right outside of Pittsburgh, uh, from steel workers all over the state. Long story short, the legislature backed up at the moment. Every year this bill gets introduced to the legislature and it wasn't the, the only part of that fight. Abortion is still available in the, in the Commonwealth, uh, but it's always an issue in our state legislature. But the point, two points I wanted to make. One is that issues, in this instance, women, women's issues, which could, it's usually cast that way, but it really isn't, uh, does require some things which are too hot to touch. You don't have to put your hand on the stove. Yeah, that's a hot issue. But the point is, as you go out and you organize, and as John said, you know, you stay with the class, not rise above the class, but have confidence in your coworkers and folks you work with and their families that even some more difficult issues we can take on and actually have an impact. So those couple of things I wanted to, to add to what John was saying, and also end by saying this, I am so excited of what I see happening right now, not only in my union, but in many, many others, in trying to deal with the just crushing poverty that's uh, throughout our region, and the impact that our unions can have, and the confidence, the growing confidence workers have, and that they can do it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Don't leave yet. <laughs> uh, we will now uh, open the floor for uh, questions and comments. If you have a question or a comment, click the picture of the raised hand. Click the picture of the raised hand icon on your control panel, and we will open your mic. So I'm looking uh, for raised hands, but while we're waiting, if anybody wants to tell us more, um, okay, I do see a raised hand. Just a second. Just a second. I think that's my. <laughs> Michael Madden, your mic is open. Yes, uh, thank you, Dee. Um, thank you, Denise, for making this very, very uh, unmistakably easy to understand. Just had a question, John, going back to your days in Santa Clara County and the organizing drive, among which it was National Semiconductor. Uh, right. Having lived in Santa Clara and was several times out distributing the paper, would just share with us a summation of how it is that the organizing drive was not able to get the full body support of the, at that time, the Santa Clara uh, Central Labor Council and, and the assessment of that, if, um, if you had an well, observation on that. Thank you, John. Thanks. Um, well, we had some support, <laughs> uh, but, um, we were, the UE was an independent union and, uh, you know, the councils were, you know, reluctant to cooperate with the UE at the time, uh, although they weren't doing any, uh, there wasn't, none of those unions at the time were, had been active um, in the electronics industry, but it was, it was growing so fast. It just so happened that, uh, you know, myself and uh, uh, a comrade named uh, Robert Garcia and Amy Newell, um, you know, went to work in the industry, um, and then we got a hold of uh, Kendra Alexander, uh, <laughs> you know, who was, I think, the DO of the party at that time in the West Coast, and she uh, got really excited about it, and uh, I think Henry Winston came out, who was the national chair at the time, and uh, uh, lots of people got enthusiastic, and so we ended up uh, building a party club around the concentration. Okay, and we ended up recruiting. Uh, we started campaigns. Uh, we had a lot of guidance from um, Amy's father, who was a former leader, founder, actually, of the United Electrical Workers, and her mother, 
both <laughs> were founders. And um, we had a lot of we had a lot of guidance and got some training, okay, in, in terms of how to do things. And uh, so we set the place on fire, really. I mean, I mean, all we had to do was at a certain point, because the industry was expanding so fast, we hand out a leaflet at one of the places and the boss would come out the next day and give everybody a 50 cent raise. I mean, it was that hot, okay, and we had um, we had three certification elections. We won two. Uh, one of them, the one that actually I was in, <laughs> ended up in the Supreme Court, and we probably set labor's rights back by about uh, you know a couple of years because our laws meant that oh, lockouts are illegal in the middle of an, of an election campaign. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and then we had a, another one that uh, we won. Um, but, uh, and we won it basically because it got bought by Westinghouse and everybody knew they would join the national UE contract when that happened. But then they closed down and moved, uh, moved it out. So, I, so there's probably nothing left of that either. Um, but you know, the, the, yeah, the tensions, it was difficult to get people to take it on. The UE itself, I remember Jim Matlas, you know, came out and was evaluating the work that we had done and gave us lots of praise. and. You know, but he said, uh, you know, he, he was questioning whether that industry would uh, was capable of being organized because because of the number of complicated factors about it. And uh, so his attitude was help was helpful and supportive, but it wasn't a giant step different than some of the unions on the Santa Clara Labor Council at the time, really either. Um, but we made a lot of hell, you know, by just a collective, okay, that expanded. And I, I think, I mean, the, the, the guys that ran the, the union campaign against the shop that I was in, you know, he was a big shot all over the county advising all the big employers about, uh, you know, union busting. And he, uh, he said, well, you know, you guys raise the way, raise the average wage in the county, you know, <laughs> no, that's why we want to destroy you. <laughs> so, uh. You know that was that's my that's my memory of it. Uh, we didn't have any bad relations with the, the council, really. I mean, they didn't want to get involved, but uh, you know, but you know, they were waving us on. Hey, good luck, <laughs> Denise. Why don't you? While I'm looking for um, raised hands, why don't you tell us about uh, what the uh, retirees are doing? Well, in organizing, some of our retirees um, have been helping their grandchildren. First of all, encouraging them to contact a union or join a union and begin the very basic um, getting a committee, getting others interested uh, together. The thing about retirees, one of the things they bring to the table, especially in helping young people in fast food or the entertainment industry or the hospitality industry, um, is the fact that the retirees bring a certain experience in dealing with things that, you know, what to expect. And I guess what comes to mind is our retirees were helping out and organizing a local grocery store, and the, uh, which was paying actually a little less than minimum wage. But nonetheless, the, uh, the truth is, is they really caution, they were always, when they would talk with young people, you know, we got to have a raise, we got to do something, we can't make ends meet, and I want to move out of my mother's house. You know what I'm saying? So our retirees have the experience of some very nasty, nasty battles uh, that took place you know, in the steel industry and the, and the electrical industry, quite as it's kept uh, Western Pennsylvania is also the Electric Valley, uh, for over many, many years. And uh, they have been we haven't had any big successes yet uh, in their efforts uh, with their grandkids to organize, but they're actively pursuing it. The other is uh, with the organization going on at the University of Pittsburgh, which is also an ugly campaign. You know, these people are supposed to be educated. Give me a break. Um, and it's ugly. It is ugly at Pitt, at the University of Pittsburgh. And the union is, uh, the steel workers are organizing the uh, staff about 3,000 professors, uh, full-time and part-time, and the adjunct staff. And the, that particular campaign, our retirees have, uh, are also working with, you know, not just participating in various rallies and marches. Uh, some of them have even spoken because some of the uh, adjunct staff in particular live in communities 
where there are retired steel workers and they talk on their front porch. That's sort of how that works. Or maybe somebody watches the kid while folks are working. But I'm just saying that the union message is not confined to you know, the full-time folks. As a matter of fact, Foster talks about the role of trusted messengers and folks who, uh, who work in the neighborhood and how that message gets out, including small business owners and the religious community. It's very, very broad based and various, you know, the NAACP and other organizations. And back in the day, it was a lot of ethnic organizations, national nationality groups, but of the role that all of them can play. And now uh, retirees, because retirees will tell you, you know, had it not been for the union, you know, we would never, ever been able to do some things like not only have a home, but be able to have a hunting cabin or, you know, be able to go to go on vacation at one time for 13 weeks, but that no longer exists, much less have health care. So that that's the only thing I would add. Okay, Dave, your mic is open. You have to open your mic on your end, which means you put your mouse uh, cursor. There you are. Speak up. Gabe, we can't hear you. Your mic is open, but we can't hear you. Turn your volume up. Try that. Turn your volume up on your computer. Okay, we can't hear you, Gabe. Sorry. Okay, looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Joel, your mic is open. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, thank you guys for um, sharing uh, all this important information for with us. Um, I want to like, I like the idea of looking back to look forward. Uh, I want to touch on the idea of industrial concentration a little bit. Um, we don't really seem to be living in that uh, time frame anymore. So, uh, but this past year and a half or so, we discovered something called the essential worker. Um, is there, which seems to be uh, uh, the the cornerstone of capitalist production today, right? The thing that keeps us going, keeps us alive. Is there a possibility to define something like essential concentration, essential worker concentration? That's my question. Thank you. You want to do that? Uh, I, I, I got a, I got a, I got an idea about that. Um, Go on, John, and then Denise can. Uh, well, okay. Suppose uh, uh, if, if it was up to me, I would set a national concentration on Amazon. Um, and in doing so, uh, I would ask some same questions that Bill Foster asked in uh, 1920. All right, in a different time and in the different circumstances. That uh, what does it take to create a base of sufficient power? to force Amazon to bargain, a company that is uh, too big to fail, that is essential to US economy and national security, that is built upon public investments in the internet and roads and bridges and education. Uh, look at all the stakeholders that are there that were not necessarily there in the 1919 steel strike, okay? You have all the pub, half the publishers in the country, half the small businesses that are marketing through Amazon. You have a, a good portion, they're the, the largest hosting service in the world. Well, maybe not outside of China, I'm not sure about that, but certainly in the United States. And um, so developers, businesses, uh, you know, uh, small businesses, bookstores, authors, writers, uh, all of these folks now are integrated into, you know, the people who have a stake in what Amazon does. So the concept of bargaining and organizing a union now, uh, especially since every Amazon fulfillment center located in usually the outskirts of major metropolitan areas, uh, will transform the political economy of that town because it's vast, it's huge. Uh, 800 bays, 3,000 workers is the typical new Amazon, Amazon uh, fulfillment center. 
So to organize it, you need to have a, an alliance with everybody affected, which is the town. And you have to, so the idea of social unionism, you know, might have been one thing in, uh, and we're able to find, if you ever watch Vegas and Banners, for example, for the, for the Flint set down strike, uh, you can see a perfect example of what was in 1935 social unionism. But you look at it now in, 19, in 2021, and a company like Amazon, now it has a different composition. And, um, you know, for example, right now we're starting a fight in Hagerstown about who's going to get hired. All right. You know, who's going to get the good jobs? If you say that, for example, African-American uh, workers who are have a significant little thing in Western Maryland there uh, are not going to get it because they're not qualified, whatever. Well, what, a, what is the local community colleges doing to prepare them? So you have qualified uh, uh, applicants that are going to get an over $15 an hour job. But once you get on it, you have the, the, the accident rate from following robots around all day in Amazon is higher than any other warehousing uh, industry in the country. Double, double the accident rates, actually. And the, uh, if, you're, if you're a single mom and you're working in the Clearbrook, Virginia facility, you can work through the hot seasons, you know, prime week and uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, but you, you'll be laid off right after it. And while you're doing it, you'll be working 60 hour weeks and maybe a double shifts. And if you arrange for your, you, and so you have to quit because your child care can't be a can't accommodate a thing like that if you're a single mom. And by the way, you're living, 300 Amazon workers in Clearbrook, Virginia, living in campgrounds, like nomad land, uh, because they're, they're going to move on to another fulfillment center uh, or another job, you know, they're, so they're not going to have a permanent residence. And Amazon is drawn upon these kind of things. So, so you can see that the movement to organize Amazon and Amazon's role in the communities is a national, uh, is a very different thing than the Great Steel Strike, but, <laughs> or industrial unionism, it's an expansion of industrial unionism to a, an even broader platform uh, than arose during the 30s. So um, I, I, I view that as a, you know, you have to be innovative. When you get a concentration, you go, you have to work with the workers. The workers, they'll figure it out. You know, you've got to figure out how to, how do you get, how do you, for example, uh, survive being fired in an Amazon facility, engage the company, defend the workers, right? But not get fired. All right. And, you know, to hold on because you you have to have a sustained campaign. Typically speaking, you know, in organizing campaigns, relationships are everything. Personal relationships are everything. How do workers know who to trust? They know who remembers their children. They know who remembers the birthdays. They know who, who attends the funeral. They know who knows who is sick and how to help. They bring food. They, I mean, they, they, they do the things that show a love for their fellow human beings and workers, and it stands out. People, people do it. You know, uh, Amy Newell's mother, Ruth Newell, organized the, uh, the first... Uh, organized the first, um, um, what was it, Sylvania plant. Uh, it was, they were, uh, they were making uh, radio tubes and they all of a sudden started making light bulbs and they hired 6,000 women. And she set up a, a nurse's office at uh, the middle of town uh, in Emporium, Pennsylvania. All right. And through, and, and, and she got, she set networks of people up. She kept an unbelievable little notebook, you know, and she offered her nursing services about, about what she had trained. You know, she went to nursing school and she got hired on the staff of John L. Lewis uh, at one point and then went to work with the UE because she married one of the founders. And, but she went in that plant all by her, uh, in that community, set up that thing. And in, by 1935, they filed for a labor board election. The company did not even know there was a union campaign. They didn't. They were surprised by the petition and they won it three to one. Um, and it was based on these unbelievable personal relationships and networks of personal relationships, you know, that she knew they knew every single nook and cranny of that plant. They knew the business model. They knew everything about it. And uh, that's how you win. Uh, but that was that, that was communist concentration um, activity. That's what that was, you know. Um, and uh, there aren't very many people in the labor movement that 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 could that could that could meet that, could measure against that. 
And the reason is, is because it's hard, you know, you go to a plant, you know, a place, you, let's say you're, you're working, in the, you have to, there's no other job, you have to work all the time, you know, you get involved in a union camp based on, based on your friends, and even some of the people you don't think that much of, you know, you, you know, there's all these things that go on, right, and family relationships, and it happens and it fails, usually the first time. Um, and how do you get your spirits back up? How do you walk into a plant after you've lost a strike? It's a similar feeling. Okay. And uh, you have to keep, you know, you have to go in and, and live and work with the people that just tried to destroy you, or you just destroyed to beat them. And that, there's a certain kind of humanity, you know, that grows in when you have to be resilient and at the same time go back in. And the communist has a vision. And it's vision that helps. It's that person in the shop that says, look, you know, we can try again. You know, we can win. You know, and uh, and we have a plan, and there's a way that life can be better. Um, that's why I think uh, you know these, these kind of efforts can um, change the world. I think Foster did, and his he had his compatriots. He had a lot of compatriots. Okay, that uh, he worked with, and um, coming out of both the IWW and the Socialist Party, um, Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. I mean, you could list a long list of people. Uh, the folks that were organizing the Tobacco Workers Union in the South. <clears throat> um, so uh, we have a similar challenge here. We have a terrible crisis in the country. We have a powerful need to organize. We need to find a new way, new ways to do it. We're kind of in a similar box that W.C. Foster was in 1920. Denise, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that question on essential workers. And we'd only add it's not just service sector, uh, because certainly in manufacturing, and I think about meat packing in particular, there are 22 meat packing plants in Pennsylvania, all of which are non-union. Uh, and in, the, in those plants, as across the country, there are a lot of folks, immigrant workers, uh, in those plants. So I would say that, yes, uh, where the service sector is usually portrayed as the face of essential workers, in particular healthcare, where the whole pandemic was very, very nasty. Also in manufacturing and most prominently uh, meat packing and processing, it was a huge, huge fight. So maybe, maybe the essential worker concept, essential workers should get an essential wage and a union. Because uh, I don't know, next week, you know, we may have a skyrocket in uh, inflation. What do I know? Oh, I'm not an economist, but I certainly need to be able to negotiate for higher wages. I need to be able to do that as well as time off and a lot of other things. But I think John covered a lot about industrial organizing and industrial unionism, you know, that it's not a blueprint. And it's, but what it is, it does recognize essential workers, manufacturing workers, service sector, the intellectual sector all these parts of our economy, all the parts of capitalism as part of the class. And the main thing that industrial unionism focuses on is that, you know, you either own it or you work in it. At least in Pittsburgh, it gets very stark that way. I, I can tell you, you either own the damn thing or you work in it. And that concept uh, is also a part of industrial unionism. Okay. Looking for raised hands. Scott Hiley, your mic is open. Hi, thanks to, uh, thanks Dee and, and John and Denise as well. Um, my question has to do with uh, sort of thinking about the, the configuration of capitalism right now and the, the growing kind of role of intellectual property uh, within it. Uh, I was reading one, uh, Marxist economist recently who talked about the what he called the becoming rent of profit. Um, so a, a technical distinction in economics: profit is something that comes from production, like making cars and and selling them, whereas rent comes from owning something, like a landlord does. And more and more, um, capitalism is is dominated by. Uh, right, we could say that capitalism always has a kind of rentier aspect to it, right? Because you know. Uh, surplus value is kind of the, the rent that the working class plays, pays to the capitalist class, you know, which owns the means of production. But it's becoming more and more pronounced, um, the fight over 
over intellectual property and the, the, the desire to control it. So it, it's what underpins the kind of ruling class assault on China. Um, uh, we see in our daily lives, um, you know, we used to buy software, buy a copy of Windows or Microsoft Word or whatever. Now we subscribe to it and we pay continuously for it. Um, we see it at Amazon, as, as John mentioned, um, their ownership of server space and their, their hosting services are, you know, uh, their, their biggest money maker, I think. We see it in, you know, throughout the process of automation, which converts the skills of the working class into something that can be owned, patented uh, by the ruling class. We see it especially in the pharmaceutical industry and the, the grotesque um, levels of, of profit that they make on an essential good. Um, so it strikes me that when we think about what the current, you know, version of industrial unionism or the current, you know, the next form, next great form of unionism might be, it will have to take into account um, a lot of the workers that, you know, we don't always sort of see or think of, including you know, workers at, at big tech firms, uh, highly skilled workers, software developers, um, all of the people engaged in producing and and protecting intellectual pro property. Um, uh, and we've seen kind of the beginnings of this, you know, I think staff at Google and also at Microsoft have, have done walkouts uh, to oppose various kinds of deals with the, between the company and the government. Um, but I think that's a that's kind of a, a sector where we we need to be looking, and we also need to be aware that you know when something like these the new uh, Biden administration plan to invigorate American um, innovation and whatever you know that that's great in a sense there is going to be some something that, that benefits the working class, but when you talk about you know, investing and developing intellectual property, those jobs tend to be much higher paid, but much fewer of them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a it's a kind of trade off. Um, so I guess I'm not exactly sure how what the way of responding to this growing emphasis on control of intellectual property is, but I think it's part of the problem we have to confront for the the next phase. Thank you. Okay, looking for raised hands. Cindy, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Here you are. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, and thank you both very much, John and Denise. And I just want to cry because we've had such an incredibly hot discussion in our club about um, union concentration and I, I mean I will say right out I was in a union for one year so I am no pro here but um, sorry but uh, such a hot discussion and um, sectors versus uh, industrialized concentration and uh, I myself not understanding a lot about it but really appreciating this and I just am um, I don't have a particular question to ask you, but just to say, I don't know if any of our um, members are on this call, but me, including the person who's most solid about how we can't do sectors, we have to do industrial concentration. And I, I don't know how to get people to come. I mean, you know, all I'm, the only point I'm making here is do I have absolutely no leadership in me at all? Or um, do we have a lot of confusion out here as to where we, what the steps are between wanting and actually fighting for? And I just read a huge uh, piece by Gloria Richardson, who just died. And as you may know, she was the Cambridge um, Nonviolent Action Committee in the 60s. And the National Guard was in Cambridge, Maryland for a year and a half because of her and the group's activism and she just she is all about how you get from the wanting to the actually fighting for and uh, I mean there's no reason that our young people should um, trust us because we're not taking them there today but then again 
I'm not sure they're understanding what the, you know, B through Y or whatever the letter before Z is. Mm -hmm. All right, that's enough. Can I respond to that, uh, Denise? Sure, go on. Mm -hmm. um, well, first on the intellectual property, uh, you know, uh, the, the big problem with intellectual property is, is that it's a crappy store of value. Uh, you can walk out of the plant out of Microsoft with uh, you know, thirty million dollars worth of code on your on your zip drive, um, and um, that's the reason why most of the software companies have gone to services because the business model of selling software doesn't work. Um, and um, so I don't, I think you know if you have to, for example, the uh, how you reward innovation is really the the question that the whole thing about intellectual property ask. And we see many aspects of innovation like open source software, for example, um, and other cooperative events where, you know, it's not necessary to pay someone a hundred million dollars for their invention. Um, and I, I, I think any, there's a lot of proposals for reform. Well, I'm gonna interrupt you just for just a second, because I really want to get at two concepts here. And one of them has to do with one piece of, uh, what do you call it, factoid. Our union, the Steelworkers Union, represents grocery workers, cops, uh, municipal workers, all over big, what were formerly big steel producing centers. And that part of that concept is industrial unionism, or in concentration, to be perfectly honest. And you know, and if it's helpful you do, Comrade, I will provide you the numbers of how many members we got where doing what. And it's not just manufacturing or basic industry. But the point is, is that when the mills were organized, the barbers in the Keysport wanted to join the union. And the point is, is when the mills got organized in up in the Shenango Valley and over in Weirton and other parts of our region, yeah, the hospital workers at the Keysport Hospital or Bond Valley Hospital now, uh, they wanted to join the union and did, and our union accepted them. Those are not two contradictory concepts. And on intellectual property, you know, I'd be very careful with that because it sort of sounds like a small business model, but that's neither here nor there. I may not understand that issue well, but I just wanted to get that out there, John. Thanks. I think a, if, you, if you don't have a concentration policy, you you for a small organization uh, for a for the Communist Party, um, it's arguable you're not going to be able to have an impact because I mean the whole idea of, of in my view of of how you make a difference in working class movements is that you collectively have to concentrate your forces on a weak point in the adversary. Now, you know, that it's a difficult thing to decide when you've got a lot of choices. And of course, the economic geography of the country is different in lots of different places. So um, I put forward the idea of Amazon, um, you know, really because it's so big and the whole movement has to do it. And doing it would win so much. I mean, so much could be on the table uh, in our country and in the movement if we could do it. I don't know that we're capable. I, maybe it's not possible. But I think a discussion about concentration and trying to come to an agreement is important, in, in, you know, in ways that collectives can become as effective as they possibly can be um, and make a difference. Um, so that's, you know, I, I think how it would apply would be different in every, every, lots of different places and lots of different factors, but I think we should move toward trying to do it. When we used to do it, uh, in places that made a big difference. Okay. And, um, it's not easy and I don't, there's not any easy answers, but, um, I think we should try, uh, to concentrate our forces. Okay, let's take okay, one. Let's, let's take one more question. Andrew, your mic is open. Andrew, your mic is open. Hover your mouse cursor over your over the picture of the mic and click. There you are. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't realize I had to do that. I'm sorry. I, I really want to thank you guys. I, I really enjoy this discussion. Um, one thing you mentioned was how Foster took a lot of his cues from the Soviet Union. And my question was about internationalism. You know, how do we gain that kind of solidarity? Where do we look 
for cues going forward, uh, those sorts of things. Thank you. Anybody? Well, if, if I may, uh, let me just offer this. Uh, as many of you know, the steel workers also represent rubber workers, oil workers, and we, what we have, internationalism right now is quite weak. And I think that uh, one of the things that the union has are what's known as international councils. The last one for rubber workers took place in Turkey. And that was obviously before the pandemic, I think it was in 2019. But even that model is not enough, which is why it's so important that the left, particularly on issues of trade and China and many, many other hot button issues in the trade union movement. Uh, it hasn't been abandoned. There have been some good initiatives, not just with the steel workers, but many other unions in understanding international capitalism or trying to understand it and deal with it. But no, that concept is alive and well, and we have to be there to make it work. What concept is that, Denise? I beg your pardon? What concept is that? International working class solidarity, I guess, is the other way okay. to say that. And actually, folks say that. And some folks say that in the Steelworkers Union. We had a late president who did. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing is on, you know, on international, for instance, we have a big alliance with Mexican copper workers, uh, Los Mineros, and, uh, and that needs to be strengthened. It needs to be stronger. I, we get no argument from steelworkers about that. Uh, to deal with, inter, you know, the, the copper corporations. But it, it's not enough, and we need the left uh, involved in all of these fights, it, you know, our clubs and those who are not copper miners or steel workers or, but we, to, to understand, uh, you know, the, all the issues that take place around China and not just the, the misinformation or whatever, but try to figure, help folks navigate that. And I think our, we have, we have, I know many comrades have struggled with this within the steel workers uh, because we represent so many manufacturing folks. But the, uh, I think we need even more on issues of trade. And those are probably the two biggest issues which come to mind very quickly. But I would just say, no, international solidarity, international working class solidarity, because God help us, the banks have international solidarity with each other. But international working class solidarity uh, is what's important. And I think you know, probably should be considered for further discussion. Uh, than here, but uh, no, the, it's alive and well and living and living. You know, the uh, uh, most big workforces now, big workplaces are not only multiracial, but multinational. And um, it becomes, I was just talking to my wife works for the uh, National Science Foundation <clears throat> and which has every nationality and racial group in the world, practically working for it in one in one capacity or another, and so it becomes uh, questions like the Israel Israel Palestine dispute, like the assassination of the Iranian uh, general there at one time, like the contest with China, uh, like the uh, folks from uh, Latin America, you know, that are that, so every time a hot button thing happens uh, in in uh, the the pits. The U.S. against some country or intervenes, whatever. Now you know people cannot. You know the people that would tend to like the Trumpers, for example, they can't shoot their math off. They can't. Um, you know, I remember when I was working when I worked for Microsoft. You know, Bill Gates put down a the, right before he retired. Well, he didn't really retire. But uh, he put out a directive saying, you can't, we cannot have redneck culture anymore. You know, we got workforces working in China, India, United States, all over the place. You have to be able to talk in a respectful way with colleagues everywhere all over the world. So from a certain cosmopolitan point of view, you know, they had to shut down uh, certain kinds of behavior, okay? And um, that's just an objective feature of the workforce that made them do that okay uh, they couldn't get a sufficient cooperation if you have this kind of bullshit going on that ge used to do in the uh, machine industry for example pitting every race and nationality against each other just to kill the union um but um 
So I think that, again, the means of production, the relations of production, the composition of our country um, is changing the question of international solidarity right on the, right on the workplace floor um, in ways that you didn't see 40 years ago. That, I'm not trying to understate the importance of, uh, you know, supporting, like, for example, the current Cuban thing. or other, I'm not trying to knock that down, but I don't think it's as hard as it once was. Okay, before we end, Joe Henry, your mic is open. Joe Henry. Uh, hover your mouse cursor over your, the pick, there you are. Okay, great. Well, thank you, comrades. Thank you, John. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, I just wanted to say as a Latino and a comrade for about 40 years, uh, having done the UPS Teamster Strike of 1997, where we took 187,000 truck drivers and warehouse workers out on strike, uh, we did uh, something similar to, to what the party had done back in the 30s and 40s. We built coalitions, we built rank and file movements uh, through 200 locals. We used uh, comrades and uh, socialists and activists in the media to make that strike successful in just two weeks. In the current period right now, not only do we see continued mobilization within transportation, but we also see it in meatpacking. As a Latino, uh, you know, those of us in the party and other groups spent a lot of time with meatpacking workers last year. 500,000 meatpacking workers, 87% people of color and immigrants. So lots of work was done in the Midwest. And uh, I foresee me packing, food processing, agricultural workers, really being on the front line of mobilization. But uh, I want to know, uh, how do you feel uh, with, with agricultural workers? How do you feel about them uh, at, in, in industrial unionism? Because th their efforts were things that were, were addressed by the party through the organizing of sharecroppers and tenant farmers, per se. But there really hasn't been as much discussion now, although I see many comrades who are Latinos doing a lot of work within that particular sector. But do you have any last words on that? Okay, before you to respond, each of you can take a few minutes to respond. Would you also include your summary remarks? Uh, John, you want to go first? You're muted, John. There you go. Okay. Um, well, uh, let me just uh, summarize first. I think that the industrial unionism um, can be best learned by applying it. <laughs> um, and uh, I encourage everyone to uh, find a way if you haven't ever done so in life, I mean, uh, find a way to get involved in an organizing campaign um, and get personally involved, get, go to work and, and, and see what happens. And, and it, it, that's the education that um, the basis for making sure that when you're out there thinking about organizing and changing everything, uh, you're not being ut utopian, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with real life. Uh, that I think that's the most important thing. And that's the lesson from Foster. Uh, get involved in the movement. If we have a strong collective behind you, if it is a concentration effort, then the shared experiences of everybody will be, you know, very valuable to each person involved. And you can learn from other people's mistakes and their successes. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll figure it out. We, we figure it out if we really work together on it. Um, if we all work on our own thing, then, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to pull it together. It's hard to pull, you know, the threads all together into a, a success. And I think that's what we, we really need. The left, you know, we have an opportunity now because of uh, a lot of circumstances. Look at the 100 campaigns, successful campaigns for elective office in the United States by socialists. 100. Wikipedia tells me, and that's just people associated with DSA, and there's others, right, that are broader than that. Um, we have a new moment here, 
and uh, that is changing right before our, our, our eyes. And so I think if we uh, take the bull by the horns, I mean, the past, if, if it's true that the passage of the PRO Act is within reach in the reconciliation project process, for example, then, and if the labor movement takes the aggressive posture that, you know, frankly, it's trying to initiate right now. I've been listening to the regional meetings President Trump has been doing. I mean, they're pretty damn good. Um, and uh, that, so, but it still was going to take at the rank and file this leadership, right? And this thing to build, to build that movement and make it take the opportunity when it confronts you, when it's there. Because, you know, it'll, uh, you, it's unequaled in the world. I'll just, I'll say that, you know, in the first organizational campaign I went into, you know, uh, I, I was elected to be the person that went in and made the, uh, with our committee, the demand for recognition in the factory. And I was scared to death. I was, I thought I'd be fired on the spot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and and when I got in there, my team, our team was with us, you know, and uh, my mouth was so dry that I wasn't sure I'd be able to say anything. All right. But then I noticed that the boss was sitting there behind his desk with his two lawyers on either side, and he lit his cigarette from the wrong end. And I said, this guy's just as scared as I am, <laughs> you know, and it was at that moment. And we, uh, and it was the fact that we did it. And then we, everyone in our committee saw, you know, that he was on the defensive, not the, uh, even with his lawyers standing beside him. And it was the thrill of a lifetime for those people. Okay. First time they stand up together. It changes your life, changes it forever. And, um, that's an experience that's, uh, you can't, you can't match. And so uh, I think that's the message of W.Z. Foster. He dug, he, he dove in with his whole life. Um, you know, he had a saying, he had another saying um, that, uh, according to Don Tormey, Foster told him, uh, and that is, if you want to be in the labor movement, you know, you have to make the working class a way of life. If they win, you win. If they lose, you lose. And um, you got to make that take 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 your hand take hands together and walk through the valley together. Um, so I th and that was a you know important important message I think if you want to make this commitment it's not it's a hard struggle it's a very hard struggle um, and there will be losses along the way and it'll break your heart in places but it will transform your life. When you see people become something bigger than they ever thought they were, um, when they uh, match the power of the company or the, or the enemy with their collective solidarity, um, you don't want to miss that in life if you get the opportunity. Denise? I thought John said that very eloquent, eloquent, eloquent. Yeah, he said that very well. The, uh, what I, the only thing I would add is uh, the other thing we really didn't get into is independent political action, which is also a part of industrial unionism. I would only say that, I would only remark that not only with the number of uh, so DSA members and other socialists getting elected to various local offices, I would really encourage folks, uh, whether you live in a farming community or you live in, you, you, know, you have agriculture or Amazon or whatever you got in town where folks work at, that, that being, having workers, <coughs> excuse me, having an industrial workers on count on their various city councils and local elections and all of those decisions and how that works is grist for another mill but i would just say it's entirely possible and more likely today than it was actually in foster's time when part of the, the, the debate was whether or not workers should participate in elections or not whether they should vote or not and uh, so as we go into the 21st century or as we're in now in the second decade of the 21st century, it's very important to recognize those changes and that that's a part of industrial unionism too, uh, for a number of reasons. I would just say, yes, look, industrial trade union, organizing a union the first time, you know, and I'll just tell one little anecdote. We were trying to get bathrooms for women in the mill, bathrooms. And it turned out the guys didn't have hot water. 
but it was the women who filed the third, uh, a third, a big grievance. And we had to meet with a superintendent. So we had a little group. And I'll never, I won't forget this as long as I live. But when we walked in, people were scared. I know I was scared. We walked in there and the mill superintendent went up one side, called us everything but a child of God. And my buddy, TJ, came across that table. And it was a big old steel desk. I don't even make them anymore. Big old steel desk. And started to grab this guy by the throat. Our chair of the grievance committee grabbed her. We all went out in the hall and we walked back in before they called us back in. And we all walked in together and said, don't you dare fire, fire TJ. Don't you dare. And this little guy looked at us. And that was the first time a lot of us. And it's usually, it's always us. And really stepped up and said, look, you're not going to talk to us that way. We're going to get our bathrooms, which we did. The guys got hot water, we got bathrooms. U.S. Steel had to pay, spend some money, God help us. But I'm just saying that, in and of itself, when you stand up together, united, and you fight back, and you actually can win, man, there's nothing in the world. That's why I'm excited going forward. Thank you all. So I'd like to thank John and Denise for participating in this class tonight. We want to do more. The working class is suffering. Uh, we are a part of the working class. We're suffering too. And uh, so we're sick of it. And we're looking for ways to move forward instead of allowing Trump and his forces to win. We want to find ways to ensure that we can advance the fight for democracy and advance the fight for the quality of life of the working class, all of the working class in this country. So I thank you very much for helping us to put attention toward those ends. And we hope everyone will join us for the future classes that we mentioned earlier. So thank you again, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.